Hello, class. Hey, this might be just about the last time I'm doing this for you. Excellent. We've made it. We're in week eight. And week eight's topic is regression analysis. What's regression analysis all about? Well, you probably remember back in high school when you had to find the equation of a straight line. You had some data and you learned how to fit a line to that data and then calculate both the slope and the y-intercept to create what we call the equation of a straight line. Well, we're doing the same thing in our section this week. Uh, we are going to have the computer create or, or give us the parameters, the slope and the y-intercept, using what's termed as least squares analysis, uh, it, which basically means fit the line, fit the best line to these points to minimize the difference between those sample points and the actual value on the line. Create the best fit is what it is. Our analysis will do that, and then we're going to do a couple things. We're going to have a, <clears throat> a hypothesis test where our null hypothesis is going to be that the slope of the line, <clears throat> excuse me, is actually zero. And if we can reject the null hypothesis, reject the null hypothesis that the slope is zero, we will then accept that, yes, there is a slope in that line, and there is a relationship between the dependent variable and the, the independent variable and the dependent variable. Uh, let's talk a little bit about one thing we'll be looking at. You may recall our coefficient of correlation r, and if we square it, we have a coefficient of determination called r squared. Now let's see, r ranges from minus 1 to 1, and r square ranges from 0 to 1. Yeah, if you square a negative number, you're going to get a positive. Well, what did our coefficient of co correlation coefficient, or coefficient of correlation, same difference, what did that mean to us? If it was equal to minus 1 or 1, we had a perfect relationship. All of our sample data points lined up on the regression line. It was perfect. Now, the line was either, um, if it was a positive one, if r was equal to 1, there was a positive relation between x value and y value. Uh, you increased one, you increased the other. Versus just turned around, if it was a negative one, all the sample points would be on the line, but as we increased one, the other would decrease. Still, a perfect correlation. It told us not only does the sample data fit the proposed model, the regression line, it also tells us that there is very little room for error. They're strongly correlated. Um, let's, uh, let's pretend this is a real data set. And let's say that we had, for our data set, an R value of 0 0.8. If I square that, I get 0 0.64 for a coefficient of determination. One thing I want you to do this week is not just state what the correlation coefficient and what the coefficient of determination are. I want you to do, interpret them for me. You can look back in Chapter 2, and also this week's chapter will tell you how to interpret the correlation coefficient. The coefficient of determination is a little bit tricky, and I want to give you a rather uh, simple way to determine what it means. But first of all, let me add some labels to this. Let's say we were studying these values um, went from 100 down to 0, and this is course grade. Course 100 is better than 0. And down here we had 10, 20, 30, and this was... hours per week 
that studying. We can imagine something like this would happen if you sampled students and asked them how long they studied each week and then um, tried to correlate that with their course grade or how well they did. You would expect the longer they study each week, the more likely they are to get a good grade. It makes sense. And with some splash, some variation around the regression line, we might expect, expect a correlation coefficient of 0.8 and a coefficient of determination of 0.64. Okay, here's the important interpretation of coefficient of determination. This means that 64% of the variation in course grade, and why is there a variation? It's because we have a bunch of different students. The values range from 100 down to, I don't know, 20 or something. 64% of the variation in course grade is caused by the number of hours per week students spend studying. It makes sense. Now, there's other things that affect how well students do in class, and that's why the coefficient of determination is only 64%. Hours of studying don't explain all variation in course grade, but it does, in this made-up case, um, explain 64% of it. That's what our coefficient of determination tells us. It tells us how much of the linear model, how much of the variation in the dependent variable is based on the model or on the input, hours per week spent studying. Okay, what are we going to be looking at in our analysis? Somebody, please buy me a new pen. I know, 39 cents, I can get one. Okay, what we are going, you are going to be looking at is the general attitude about one of our malls. Let's see, we'll start with Springdale. And also, you are going to be looking at I believe it's variety of sizes and styles. First of all, let me double check. Yep. Variety of sizes and styles. So, when we looked at attitudes about Springdale Mall, that is variable number seven, and they range from one to five. Sorry, I ran out of room. I'm drawn inside my graph. And the variety of sizes and styles, in terms of importance, people rated those from one to seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And so we're gonna, you're gonna take that data and you're gonna get some sort of a plot. I don't know how it looks like, actually I do. But it doesn't look like that. It doesn't look like that. Yeah, so we're going to create an equation. A regressed line. A least squares best fit line. And what we're trying to attempt to see is how much of the importance of a variety of sizes and styles, how much of that affects the people's attitudes about Springdale Mall. Well, if it's very important, if it's highly correlated, if uh, it's a significant um, slope, well, that's important for the mall manager to know. Yeah, I better keep up the variety of sizes and styles because they have a lot to do with people's attitudes about the mall as a whole. All right, but I'm not going to look at that one. I am going to look at the downtown mall and look at the attitude about the downtown mall, which is kind of the middle child, the forgotten mall. 
attitude about that versus what did I say I was going to do? Sales staff helpful friendly. Helpful friendly staff. And once again, people rated this one to five, and they rated helpful staff one to seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, I'm going to jump to Excel now. It's pretty quick and simple. Oh, I know I want to do one other thing before I go there. Um, and we will let our computer calculate what the regression line is. We'll let the computer tell us whether or not the slope is equal to zero. That's our null hypothesis, that it is equal to zero. We'll be looking at the p-parameter, and as you recall, if the p-value is less than our specified alpha level, then we reject h naught. We reject h naught, which says that the slope is zero, and we'll accept that there a relationship exists between the dependent and independent variables. But first of all, we're also going to be looking at something called the residuals. Whenever you have data points, there's some distance from the proposed regression line. And that distance is called the error or the residual. Now, one of the, one of the assumptions we make in our regression analysis technique is that these errors are normally distributed that there's both negative and positive ones, and they, the, they form a bell curve. And it was kind of an interesting picture that you saw in the text, and it looked something like this. For this value, we expect our errors to be normally distributed. Some of them, one's up, oh, let's say if there was one up here, that's towards one of the tails of our normal distribution. We wouldn't expect many of those. Most of them, we're going to expect to be quite near the regression line. That's where the majority of things fall. Uh, negative errors, yeah, again, not many of them. That's near the other end of our normal distribution. We will be looking at residuals, but I'm going to get to Excel first, and we're going to do our analysis. Okay, so I pull up I pull up our char um, data, and again, or not again, we will use Excel's data analysis, and we'll choose regression. And first of all, the input Y range. Well, why is that vertical on the vertical axis? And we want that to be uh, the attitude about the mall. And so let's see, I want a downtown mall. So I'm going to go over here. And I think it's already set I2 to I152. Is that downtown like? Yes, it is. I2 to 152. I'm not even going to mess with that. 152. Yep. And my X range says W2 to 152. What's W? That should be number 22. W. Is it parameter 22? Sure enough, that's our help. I have chosen labels. I have included labels in both of them. My confidence level is 95%. I believe we're asked for 95%. Aren't we? Let me double check. Yep, use the 05 level of confidence. I'm going to put my answers in a new worksheet, 
and I need to check all four of these residual boxes. And that's it. We say OK. And here is our answers. First of all, I'm going to clean things up just a little bit, do a few less significant figures. Oh, give me another couple more than that. We've got two graphs here. And this is our most important one. Well, I don't know if po most important is the right word. But I'm going to delete this. I'm going to delete on these red guys, which is actually the prediction line. And then I'm going to right click on another dot and say, give me the trend line. I want the linear trend line. And I want to check both display equation on chart and display R squared value on chart. And there we go. Put this somewhere where we can see it. There is our regression line. These points represent all of our data. And the model says that why people's feelings about downtown, ranging from 1 to 5, are equal to negative 0 0.0569 times the input value plus 3.8. Our squared value is quite low. It's 0 0.0106, which says just over 1% of people's feelings about the mall can be explained by what they feel about the help. There's not much there, is there? Sure doesn't appear to be. That slope is very flat. Now let's see. Up here, those values are repeated. Oopsie, didn't want to do that. Wanted to do that. There's our coefficient, our correlation coefficient. It's equal to 0.1. And if you square 0.1, you get 0.01. That's our r squared, our coefficient of determination. Now, we also are given a p-value. And the one we want to look at is right here. I'll highlight that. This is the analysis that tells us whether we accept H0, which says that the slope of the line is equal to 0, or whether we reject it. Now let's jump back to my board here. So our H0 is that the slope is equal to 0. And our alternative hypothesis is that the slope is not equal to 0. Wow, twice in a row. So recall, with our p-values, how do we interpret them? If the p-value is less than our specified significance level, if p-value is less than the specified level, then we reject h naught. So, in our case, our significance level is 0 0.05. However, the p-value that resulted from our analysis is 0 0.21. And again, I have to look at the uh, IMP, Importance of Help, value here. And this is actually looking at the slope. This p-value represents the slope. And you might also notice that those two values there are also 
the two values, the slope and the y-intercept. So yes, we are evaluating the slope, and this p-value is 0.21. Okay, p is 0.21. p-value is 0 0.21. Hmm, what did I do? Not something I wanted to do. Move back. Help. There we go. Something like that. Cut my head off. No loss. There we go. Okay. Close enough. So, our p-value was 0 0.21. Is it less than our specified significant le significance level? In our case, let's see, our significance level is 0 0.05. Is the p-value less than 0 0.05? No, it's not. We cannot reject H0. We cannot reject that the slope is 0, which means we must conclude that the slope is 0. Hmm, let's go back and look at our data again. Does that make sense? Sure enough, we have a pretty flat slope. Our correlation coefficient is very small. Our coefficient of determination is even smaller. There is not much of a relationship between the importance of help and or how people related the importance of help versus how they rated the downtown mall. Once again, our p-value was not less than the specified significance level. We couldn't reject H0. No, we must accept or fail to reject H0. We're going to accept that the slope is equal to 0. Okay. Let's do a couple. Let's now... Do a couple of the things that I want you to do. I want you, number one, to create a histogram of the residuals. And let's see. In our output, here are the residuals right here. We had 150 values. Here's the predicted value based on our regression line. And the difference between, oh, if we had a value of 3, let's see, we would have predicted the output would have been 3.8. The difference between that and where the value really fell is the residual. So we want a histogram of this residuals. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to highlight all the residual values, and I'm going to find the max and the min value. I guess I did that wrong. I'm going to go up to auto sum and say max. And yeah, do I want C25 to C175? Well, it's close to that. So I'll highlight them again. C25, 174. Hit enter. The max value in that whole column of residuals was 1.58. What's the min value? The minimum value was negative 2.69. Okay, now recall to create a histogram, we needed bin values. And so right here, I'm going to type bin, which I still have no idea what it means. And let's see, I'm going to go from negative 0.3, negative 3, and I've done this a couple times, so I think I know what I need to do. And I'm going to go to negative 2.5. And then I'm going to use that same, use autofill to get me up to 1.5. No, I want to go one higher than that. 2.0. I've just created equidistant blocks, which are going to be 
in our histogram um, the endpoints and we'll have a range of numbers here how many values fall in that range so now our histogram friend let's see data that's data analysis histogram okay input range I will do that again My residuals are my inputs. My bin range is right there. This time I did not include the labels. The output range, I'm going to drop them right there. And I want the chart, so I'm going to check that. I say OK. And there's my histogram. The histogram, it says uh, between two and a half and three, there were four values. None greater than three. None greater than two. But between one and a half and two, there were seven values. And here's the histogram of those. Again, clean this up a little bit. Make this bigger so we can see things. And you'll do more cleaning up. I recall when we created histograms, we liked these columns to reach each other. But here's the part where we're evaluating whether the residuals are actually normally distributed. If they were normally distributed, the, the center of them should be at zero. And lo and behold, the number of values that were right in that zero block there's we had the most of those but does this look like a normal distribution beyond that well I'm gonna say no because we've got some pretty high values over here versus two that don't meet it and also some other higher ones compared to on the left yeah it looks a little bit like a normal distribution but I'm not so certain that it is and in my analysis or in my conclusions in my paper I would say that our histogram of the residuals shows that the residuals, which are a reflection of the actual sample values, may not be normally distributed. And our model may not be the best model to use. Well, we have no other choice for, for this class for our analysis, but it's just one thing that we look at, uh, st statisticians, when doing this sort of analysis, they're interested in residuals and whether they are normally distributed. Okay. Back up. There's a regression line. Again, we found out that no, we're not going to reject the null hypothesis. We think that that is a flat line. There is no relationship between the importance of what, how people related the importance of help and how re they evaluated how much they liked the downtown mall. We have one more plot up here to look at, and this is what's called a residual plot. I'll give myself a little room here. I'm gonna expand this guy out a little bit. And again, we are looking at residuals. We looked at the histogram, but I also want you to look and evaluate the residuals thinking about I'm turning in my book to the right page here thinking about what the author taught us on page 579 another of the assumptions of the regression model regards something that's very difficult <laughs> to pronounce. Homosedasticity. Homosedasticity says that the standard deviation of the values about the regression line are the same. Likewise, we can look at the residuals and see if the standard deviation of the residuals about the regression line is equal. Now we can do that with this plot, our residual plot, which was created. And you can see we're looking at um, our values, 
1 through 7 of the importance of help versus the residual, which was determined from our um, regression line. And if you look on page 579 and read what the author says about figure 15.5, you'll get some idea of how to interpret this. In general, we want to see values, the same number of values on both sides of the line, and we want them to be as far apart as on both sides of the line. And this set of data is fairly good. There's a few lower values on this side, um, but what, you, what we don't can't see in this is that some of these values actually represent multiple values. And I think when I click on it like that, when I hit one, that lights them all up. Uh, I'm not sure I'd have to check. Um, for example, these points might each represent four or five or six data points. I didn't quite figure that one out yet. However, in general, we can look at this plot and compare it to the values in 15.5 and determine whether we have homocedasticity. There, I said it right. Whether the standard deviation of the residuals about the regression line is equal or approximately equal. So there's what I want you to do for this week's work. I want you to create your histogram and tell me whether you think the residuals are normally distributed. That's one important part of the assumption of the regression model. I also want you to look at the residual plot and compare it to page 569 and, and see whether, uh, how, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, make an examination of the distribution of the residuals about the line and whether they all seem to be about the same. Um, if these guys were all really tight at this end and then they got wider and wider at the other end, that would be a problem. But no, this group looks pretty good to me. And the first thing you would have done is create the regression line. Tell me what the regression model is. Discuss the correlation coefficient and the coefficient of determination. And of course, state whether you're going to accept or reject the null hypothesis that the slope of the line is equal to zero. Well, folks, I think that's it. That's a 32, 33 minute video, but that will be enough. Your author actually talks about doing a couple other things. Let's see. Number two, it says the normal probability plot. Forget about that one. Okay, I think this will be enough for this week. Um, you're going to do, again, you're going to look at Springdale, and you're going to look at two different um, regress people's feelings about general attitude about Springdale on two different um, other parameters, um, good variety of sizes, styles, and also a lot of bargain sales. And then you will look Repeat that for looking at West Mall. Recall that West Mall was our bargain mall. So let's think about this. Let's talk about this. What are we going to expect to happen? When we regress good variety of bargain or good variety of sizes and styles on how people feel about the Springdale Mall, um, yeah, maybe we will expect to see a positive correlation and a non zero slope. That would make sense. Uh, after all, People rely on that Springdale Mall for um, good prices, variety, and uh, that, that makes sense. How about bargain sales? Was bargain sales ever big at the Springdale Mall? Are we going to expect that people's feelings about bargain malls have a lot to do with how they feel about the Springdale Mall? I would say no. Springdale's not our bargain mall. However, you're also going to look at the West Mall and these same two parameters variety of sizes, styles, and bargains. Well, it might be just turned around there, don't you suppose? West Mall is our bargain mall, so bargain sales are going to be important. But variety of sizes and styles? Hmm, maybe not so much. 
look back at your week one, is it? Yeah, week one where we created our frequency, uh, our frequency distributions, our histograms. And you'll see what I'm talking about. All right, folks, good luck. Give me a call. I'm around. Hey, we're almost done. Let's let's do it.